This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. If you're planning to put up a birdhouse for some of our avian friends to nest in next year, now is the time to make your plans a reality by constructing and installing one or more nest boxes before the nesting seasons begin. Our friend Joe McGee is here to share tips about making your nest box and what birds to look for in December in Mississippi. Also, Dr. Major is always ready for pet questions. Libby will join us uh, to uh, talk about your brushes with nature. Join our conversation this morning by calling one 877 MPB ring. It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. And if you ever miss the Creature Comforts broadcast on Thursday, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning. We'll start with Libby joining us from Oregon. Uh, Libby, what are the things that you're seeing on your latest trip out west? Hi. Um, one of the things I thought I might mention is how many bald eagles we've been seeing. Um, I imagine that we would be seeing bald eagles if we were in Mississippi, and I was kind of excited to see the number of bald eagles we have out here. We've actually seen two adult um, adult couple um, here in our neighborhood in one of the tallest evergreens, and uh, that's been fun. We started watching them. It's a little too early for them to be nesting, but uh, they're um, evidently feeding in the area. And then we saw one interesting thing with a, a bald eagle that I thought I would mention, and I've seen this before, but it, it's not something that we've talked about on the air, a uh, bald eagle scavenging by the road. You know, we've been on the road a lot. It was uh, about six days of driving to get out here. So, um, and really interesting driving because we went through so many different habitats. But uh, one time we got really good looks at a bald eagle, we were we were on a, a kind of a remote county road close to a very big lake, so you would expect bald eagles to be there eating fish. But this bald eagle was eating a mule deer that had been hit by a car. You know, it was a, a road kill, and he was sharing the carcass with a magpie. Now, maybe reluctantly sharing. I don't know. A magpie is not nearly as big as a bald eagle, but it's still a pretty big bird kind of aggressive, but they were both eating, and they didn't mind if we um, slowed down there and had a good look at them. So that's something, I guess, that we kind of forget sometimes because bald eagles are so majestic, and we um, see them fishing and eating fish, which is what they love to do, but they're not going to pass up an easy meal, and carrying on the road, of course, is an easy meal, and it's probably very fresh meat. So he uh, was definitely doing that. And you can see that in Mississippi, too, although I've not gotten such a a close look at one in the past. Um, You know, I I do the the bad thing about subscribing uh, human things to animals. And and to me, do you imagine the the smaller bird uh, worked up enough nerve to go up with the bald eagles and and munch out on the carrion? So uh, he probably was uh, high on the hogs with his other bird friends, I guess, for doing that. And that proves if you... Sometimes get out of your comfort zone, good things will happen to you, I guess. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Kevin. We all know that we shouldn't equate them with human emotions or human characteristics, but it's kind of hard not to. That's exactly what I thought about that that, um, that magpie. That's a pretty gutsy little magpie there. <laughs> Although, like I say, they're used to being top dog when they're in most environments. They're such a big bird, but um, with that bald eagle, he didn't mind. Uh, he looked like he was holding his own. They were just right there together. You know, Libby, uh, this is Joe. Hey, Joe. Benjamin Franklin was opposed to having the bald eagle as our, one of our national symbols because it eats yeah. carrion, because of just what yeah. you saw. <laughs> yeah. He was in yeah. favor of having the turkey, the wild turkey, as our national bird. And I can see some merit to having the wild turkey. They are absolutely beautiful birds, and... I'm sure they were, they're tasty birds, but uh, wild turkey was, I'm sure, a, 
a primary food source in the colonies. It had to have been, huh? Right. Yeah, I think so. Well, that's yeah, curious because I wonder what would have happened to Thanksgiving had the, the wild turkey been adopted as our national symbol. Would we be eating <laughs> chicken maybe for Thanksgiving dinner? Without a doubt. <laughs> Without a doubt, it would be chicken. I don't know. Now, that would be hard to pass up a good turkey. <laughs> it would, um, oh, the other thing I guess I would say, if you're going to put um, human characteristics on eagle. The fact that they eat carrion and that they sometimes steal food from other birds or, you know, compete pretty uh, rigorously with other birds for food. Um, they're, you know, they're adapted to how they have to live and they're really good at staying alive. They're, you know, they do what they have to do to stay alive and feed their family. So, Libby, what's the weather like out there in Oregon? It's been, um, we've had some pretty weather, uh, you know, some sunny weather. I guess I shouldn't say pretty because it can be beautiful when it's rainy. Uh, we've had some, we had one really, I would say, heavy snow that did not stick or only, you know, stuck for just a little while. But it was really fun to um, walk around in it and watch it through the windows and big, fluffy snowflakes falling very densely, and um, it was a lot of um, precipitation. Uh, the good thing about snow like that is that it doesn't tend to run off like a heavy rain would. So you get a good coating of snow, and even if it melts pretty quick, that's great for your trees. And if you're a, of course, if you're a wine grower out here, we we um, there are a lot of Pinot Noir grapes around us, and um, that's just the perfect kind of moisture. It's hits them and slowly soaks in. Well, Libby, we always appreciate you joining us when you travel out to visit friends uh, out there in Oregon, and, and we uh, enjoy hearing uh, the reports from uh, some place in the United States that's g- quite different from Mississippi, I think. So we appreciate you always joining us uh, via the telephone. Dr. Major is on the line with us as well. And Dr. Major, got a couple of uh, pet questions for you. Let's start in Hattiesburg. Ellen has called in today. Good morning, Ellen. You're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, Thank you so much. Uh, I am calling because of a question I have about neutering my standard poodle puppy. Uh, I read some information that advised owners to hold off neutering until the puppy is 18 months old. Go ahead, Dr. Major. In other words, you're saying, they're saying, wait until they're 18 months old, year and a half. Is that correct? Yes. This varies. uh, There's a lot of information out there uh, for that. One way or the other, a lot of the, uh, I think, uh, male dogs are neutered too early. Uh, I would say a minimum, if possible, of around six months. And then, depending on the breed, uh, uh, possibly longer. The bigger the breed, the, the longer I would wait. Uh, a lot of things have to enter in with this, and one of the things is uh, an inside dog starts to mark its territory a lot of times uh, when it's not neutered, and that can be a big issue uh, if you have a dog that walks around and urinates on the couch or wherever. So I would say that the breed probably would dictate when you would have the dog neutered, and there's nothing wrong with waiting to a year and a half. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wondered, you know, if it would help some of his exuberant puppiness, and um, he's so big that it's hard for me to manage, but I don't want to jeopardize right. his health. Right, and there's there's a lot of controversy with this. So I, I would say that it's a personal choice. It should help some with his uh, exuberance. On the other hand, I know neutered dogs that are as as exuberant uh, as they were before they were neutered. So that's not always a guarantee that it will uh, make them less less active, less exuberant. 
All right, Ellen, uh, thanks for your call this morning. And I would uh, say, Dr. Major, and I think you would probably agree with this, that in any time we get a pet question, you can give some general answers, but uh, someone's veterinarian would know about that animal, the particulars of their situation. And so always uh, best to get some general advice here on the air and then uh, go back to your vet to, to get more specific advice what to do uh, in each and every situation. That's true. And a lot of times there may be some conflict between the breeder uh, whoever uh, is the breeder of this dog and the veterinarian. So you have to weigh that and uh, decide basically on your own what to do. But there are pros and cons for both uh, early neutering or uh, waiting a while. Let's get one more pet question in before our first break. And it's uh, James who's called in from Nashville. Good morning, James. You're on the air with us. Hello. How are you doing today? Good. What do you have for us? Um, I am wanting to rehome a dog or get, go to the Humane Society to get a new dog. But I had a dog for 15 years, and my furniture is the old dog smell. So how can I actually... There's one or two pieces of furniture that I want to actually get rid of. So, But the rest, the carpet, things like that, I can't get rid of the carpet. So how can I actually right. bring the new dog in? and make them comfortable with the old dog smell? That's a great question. I, I would say that most most dogs will be fine with that, uh, with the old dog smell. I would suggest, a, I don't know what size dog you're looking for, but certainly a, a large cuddler bed for the dog uh, that could be his own. His own toys certainly uh, would, would enter yes. in rather than having uh, toys from the old dog. Uh, but I think it, in most cases, it's not that big an issue. It just depends on the dog. But certainly new bedding, um, and if you had to deep clean, that might help some as well. Uh, yeah. Especially the carpet and uh, and so forth, this sort of thing. But if you're going to get rid of some of the furniture, I'd say go on and do that, and that could help with the, the particular odor or scent. I suspect, yes. though, that most dogs will tolerate uh, pretty well, and best of luck to you. But just get plenty of new bedding, that sort of thing, and toys. And I believe this new dog, just uh, hope for the best, and I certainly wish you the best. It's a great question, though. And uh, Thank you very best much. Of luck. Welcome. Thanks, James, for your call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio, and it's time for our first break of the hour. We'll talk uh, nest box construction ahead of the nesting season and what birds you can see and hear in December with our guest, Joe McGee. You can call with questions and comments. The phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. We're back on Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield. And today in studio, we have our one of our favorite guests on Creature Comforts, biologist Joe McGee. If you want to join our conversation with a question or comment, the phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Good morning, Joe. Always uh, appreciate you coming in to visit with us on Creature Comforts. Uh, before we talk about building birdhouses, maybe talk about a few of the birds that people should be on the lookout now this time of year in Mississippi. Okay, one that uh, one small bird they might have been overlooking is a little bird called a ruby-crowned kinglet. It's about the size of a chickadee, more or less. Kind of nondescript, though. It, it's just sort of a olive gray color all over occurs in woods and brushy areas uh, around the edges of fields and woodland edges and it's one that responds well to pishing psh, 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 psh. that's something that birders do to get birds to come out and it's one of those that'll come out and it'll hang around a while once you've done that and if it's a male 
he may display his ruby crown, the thing that they're named for, bright red feathers that he erects like a, uh, like a crest, briefly. Now that is the song that he's playing, the song of the ruby crown queen. It's one of the most beautiful songs in nature, I think, but they don't sing this time of year. Can you find that, uh, that scolding note they do? That's what you can really hear, and you can learn to count even ruby crown kinglets that are around without ever seeing one. Hmm. It has a very distinctive... It sounds like somebody winding up a little uh, toy, one of, the, one of the little wind-up toys. It's called a scolding note or a fuss note, alarm call maybe. No, that's... 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 Mm-mm. That sounds like an alarm going that's, off. That's, yeah, <laughs> but that's not it. There you go. There it is. One of the most common sounds in the woods in Mississippi this time of year, or any out of doors. I bet you could find some right here at this uh, at, the, at the location of this studio. Well, a quick follow-up on the pishing. Is that the birds hear that and they're just saying, like, what is that? Um, let me come out and see what's going on. Yeah, birds, small land birds especially, have a habit of uh, scolding a predator that they may find. And in the daytime, they may find an owl that's roosting somewhere. And they'll move in, and chickadees, titmice, the kinglets move in and start scolding that bird and actually fly at it. And I've seen them actually hit the, bird, hit the hawk hmm. or the owl. It could be a hawk, but usually it's an owl in the daytime. And I guess they're trying to drive it away. They'll do the same thing for a cat if they find a cat sort of prowling through the undergrowth or in the summertime, a snake. That's one of the ways I locate snakes around my house in the summer. The birds start scolding. They're apparently trying to drive a predator away or or alert other birds to the fact that there is a predator in the area. It's a response to, to seeing a predator. So birders use that as a way to get the birds to come in. They hear it. Chickadees and titmice especially come in in the kinglets. They hear you doing that, and they think, ah, there's a predator somewhere around. They move in, then others move in, and it's a good way to get uh, hard-to-see birds to come out for just a little while. Hmm. Uh, so I, I have respect now for these smaller birds that seem to have a, a, a backbone, as it were. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. They're They've not got... afraid of you know, flying right in there. One of my earliest childhood, well, I shouldn't say earliest childhood memories, but we, I used to have to walk a ways to get, catch a school bus. And I can remember seeing small birds mob, it's called mobbing, mobbing an owl that was sitting out in the open. Hmm. And I had never read anything about it. I didn't know what was going on, of course, but I've since learned. So uh, what else might be we seeing this time of year? There's another little kinglet uh, that's present uh, in Mississippi in the wintertime. It's called a golden-crowned kinglet. A little bit harder to see. They're not much larger than a hummingbird, very small. Tend to stay up h- higher in the trees, I believe. So you really have to fish a lot to get them to, to come into view. There's another bird that's... I wonder how many listeners have seen this bird. It's called a brown creeper. And it's only present in Mississippi in the wintertime. Uh, they will occasionally come to feeders, uh, suet, that sort of thing. So will the kinglets, by the way. They'll come to, to uh, suet. Brown creeper could be overlooked. You, and all of a sudden you realize there, this thing you thought was just a leaf on the trunk of the tree, you know, kind of hooked on the trunk, is it actually a little bird as they creep their way up, poking their long, thin bill into crevices in the bark to look for something to eat. That's a good we can only see in the, in the wintertime in Mississippi. Uh, what about uh, birds of prey? Are they prevalent this time of year? Yeah. You know, Libby was mentioning driving. Apparently, they drove to Oregon this time. And I'll bet you they saw lots of birds of prey on the, in those really open areas out west. But here in Mississippi, yeah, it's a good time to see uh, red-tailed hawks of various kinds. Some red-tailed hawks are almost black. And there's one subspecies called a Harlan's hawk that's almost all black, and occasionally they see that one up in the northwestern part of the state. Then there's one that's almost all white, Crider's hawk, and uh, it's also seen up that way. Good time of the year to see red-tailed hawks, because in this, they're here in the summer, and they breed in Mississippi, but n- not in great numbers. And sometimes I go through an entire summer without actually seeing a red-tailed hawk. I'm always kind of s- surprised when I do see one. It's a big bird. How can you miss a red-tailed hawk? <laughs> So is there something about the winter that brings these birds out? Is that just their time of year? Uh, it could be the snow cover up north. It's, you know, they uh, fly over and take small mammals off the ground, and it probably gets harder for them to find something to eat 
Uh, I'm not sh- I think, wasn't I hearing it was 70 degrees in Kansas yesterday or where they're having the windstorms? So that probably will affect the numbers of uh, birds of prey that we actually see in Mississippi. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We'll be visiting with our guest Joe McGee throughout the hour. Back to the phone lines we go. We'll start uh, first in Beaumont. Our friend Sue is on the line. Hello, Sue. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Um, good morning. <clears throat> I was wondering if these weird weather patterns have got the migrating birds confused. I mean, would they stop here in Mississippi with it being so warm and all to, to feed or, or rest and uh, just decide to stay? I mean, how, how, do they, how do they know when it's time to get up and go again? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question that ornithologists are constantly asking. I think most of the small birds have already migrated. They're kind of where they're going to be. But occasionally one does get lost and shows up, and they would find this weather we're having hospitable. Uh, recently somebody found a, uh, a western a western kingbird, and we have eastern kingbirds that breed in Mississippi. Somebody found a western kingbird down in, I think it was in Hancock County recently, somehow showed up. Occasionally we have hummingbirds that show up in the, in the winter. But the birds migrate actually before the weather gets really rough, you know, before the really cold, blustery weather uh, takes hold. And the ones from the north are already here. I have white-throated sparrows coming to my feeders. Uh, let's see, what other kinds of birds? Oh, uh, eastern phoebes are more numerous in Mississippi in uh, this time of year. than they, they also breed in the state, but they're more common this time of year. All right, Sue, always good to hear from you. Thanks for the call. Let's uh, stay on the phone lines. Uh, Dr. Major, we've got a pet question for you coming from Lauren in Natchez. Go ahead, Lauren. Good morning. Morning. I have a question about uh, guinea pigs and vitamin C supplements. Humans actually absorb sodium ascorbate. Is that going to be suitable for guinea pigs also, or do they need ascorbic acid? You know, I think probably the uh, human preparation would be okay. Uh, have you got that on hand? Yes, it's just crystal form, just pure right, crystal. Right. right. I would I would go online and, and get the uh, uh, guinea pig uh, formula. You can get that in a in either a liquid or, or powder. It might be easier to administer. Uh, and I would check online. Okay. Uh, you should be able to look that up without any problem. And uh, how many guinea pigs do you have? Um, oh, four or five. I would okay. usually just put it put it in the water. Yes, I think that would be fine. Uh, sounds like you have a small small herd of guinea pigs. <laughs> That's good. And uh, they uh, they're amusing and quite friendly pets, and uh, I'm sure that you take good care of them. I think putting it in the water is fine, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren, for your call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Before our next break, uh, Joe, we've talked on the show about the Christmas bird count. Kind of remind us uh, what that is and and, and if you know how it's going this year. Uh, I think it starts this coming Saturday. And it's something sponsored, or it originated with the National Audubon Society, and it's where uh, groups, local groups, get out and count all the birds within an area of, uh, with a radius of, I believe it's seven and a half miles, 15 mile diameter. That would be the count circle. Uh, I th- I'm not sure wh- the specific dates. I think the one for the Ross Barnett Reservoir maybe is this Saturday, the 18th, but I'm not positive about that. But anyone could check, you know, go online and check with the Mississippi Audubon to find out when they are there's oh there must be about 10 or 12 christmas bird counts in mississippi and they don't take place on christmas day they start in like the saturday before christmas which is this coming saturday and go till the i believe the first saturday after new year's and a group decides what's you know what's a convenient date for them to get out and count the wintertime birds so, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, if you're interested in uh, maybe participating or just want to find out more about it, uh, you could search for uh, Audubon, Mississippi, and uh, their website would have some information. Uh, let's get one call in before this next break. Our friend Kathleen in Osaka is on the line. Good morning, Kathleen. Good morning, guys. Um, I have a question for the animal team right there. I have a rabbit that uh, I've had since 2013, 
And she may have been a year or two older than that when I got her, because the older gentleman that had her died, and I got elected to take her in. But it seems when I go to put my hand in the cage, all of a sudden, she um, runs for me, kind of charges. And then I don't know if she can see who it is in house or vision and do rabbit smell. Can they tell one plant or something from the other? Uh, Dr. Major, you want to take that one? Yeah, great question as far as, as uh, the rabbit is concerned. She's getting on up there in years. Uh, certainly, uh, I just wonder if she may be nearly blind or have cataracts. Uh, she may not be able to see as well as as she has in the past. Uh, Her eyes look might, real clear. Right. And, and, you know, but she may still have some issues seeing. As far as smell, yes, they can smell. Her age, you know, she's, if you got her in 13 and didn't know her age, she's probably, what, 8 to 10 years old? Is that uh-huh. about, about right? I, I, I confess, she tells it because of me. I'm so dedicated. Every day I right. take a basket and go out in the yard and pick her greens that they would eat in the wild. And I feed right. her a whole basket full, locating them in her cage. And she sniffs right. them out and decides which one she wants to eat first. Exactly. And uh, certainly they can smell. I just wonder if she is having some eyesight problems. She started to charge you. Uh, yeah. I would say just uh, maybe uh, use a small, I wouldn't say anything heavy, but just a little something to let, you, let her know you're there. And uh, does she let you pick her up? Oh, yeah, yeah, and I take okay. her swimming yeah. in a special little swimming pool, and uh, okay. <laughs> I, this... when I pet the top of her head, she calms down, but getting my hand right. against that mouth and feet, you know. Right, right. Sounds like you have a rabbit spa just about, <laughs> so that's great, and uh wish we could all be well cared for like that. <laughs> I would say that just something, you know, whether it's a... Uh, whether you've got a big feather or something like that, you can let her know you're there. Uh, and once you, you say once you pet her, able to pet her on the head, she's okay. But just uh, I still believe that she may be having some vision problems based on what you're telling. I think I'll use one of those little twig limbs that are like on a branch with leaves on it. That'll distract her. Just, just okay. something to let her know you're there. And she may, I don't know if she's hard of hearing or not, but uh, certainly... Uh, small animals can can lose their sense of hearing just like us larger animals can lose their sense of hearing. So uh, she's she's geriatric. I won't say she's gone past her expiration date, but she, you've taken such good care of her that she should go on for a long time yet. All right, Kathleen, good to hear from you this morning. It's time for another break on Creature Comforts. When we come back, will we continue talking with our guest, Joe McGee, and we'll talk about how a bird box can make your home a main attraction during nesting season. Also, Dr. Major will be here ready for pet questions. So call in with questions and comments. The phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest in the studio today is Joe McGee. We're talking about birds. If you want to join our conversation with a question or comment, got some open phone lines at one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. We're going to talk about uh, bird houses and and bird boxes in just a minute, but we do have uh, Mikey on the line from Mobile. Good morning, Mikey. You're on the air with us. Well, Dr. Troy was saying, Jerry who? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, the census thing, it's, 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 It's kind of uncanny how Sue and I get on the same wavelength and start thinking about stuff. Um, uh, from a previous guest, uh, I learned that snakes have a very strong sense of smell. And from people that I know who raise birds, they've always said that birds love hot peppers. They always gave their birds hot peppers um, because they didn't have much of a sense of taste. Now, 
my question about this, and I, I have another one also, um, is related to taste and smell, as in mammals, which would that would be that would be me, right? And all of us. <laughs> um, uh, uh, okay, okay. I, I'm just trying to see. I, I'm doing the best I can. I ain't no scientist, obviously. Um, and, and my second question, the big second would big question that relates to this is that when you're doing your cleaning, which m- many of us are because our houses stink at this time of year when you close everything up, um, uh, the methods to both encourage and discourage, you know, encourage what you do want, which is a good smell and not mess with your pets, and discourage what you don't want, which are the uninvited like the squirrels and the rats, okay? Okay, so you're you're saying what would you use to help with the smells at the same time not uh, cause problems with your pets that you have inside? Yes, sir. So, and uh, you know that gets to be a problem. Uh, there's some safe uh, odor things for for pets. Uh, you know, Febreze, for example, uh, does in, in most cases does a good job. As far as deterring uh, rodents and this sort of thing, that's a real problem. You've got cats, though, haven't you? Not anymore. Not anymore. Cats are the best deterrent for for rodents that we have. Uh, maybe secondarily to snakes, but you don't want a snake in your house. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things you can do. There may be some people that could give you better ideas than me, but one of those things, there are odor neutralizers that are available. Uh, for example, if uh, you have urine spills from a dog, not urine spills, but urine uh, on the carpet or the same, there are some things that you can get uh, which would neutralize uh, those smells, which would help a lot. Uh, well, we'll as, what, uh, as far as as far as things to deter and, uh, to uh, mice and other rodents, I think uh, maybe somebody else could help. Joe may have some ideas about that. Uh, but you want to be safe from the standpoint of your pets that you have. Uh, as far as taste, it varies from uh, species to species. I know that a lot of the birds, uh, parrots, etc., they like to have the uh, red peppers. Uh, Actually, they like those very much, and it is included in some some of the uh, commercial bird foods. Uh, other animals uh, crave salt, for example, and uh, they have that ability to, to know things that are salty. Uh, so it varies from breed to breed, just like to a certain extent it varies with us. Uh, of course, now with COVID-19, uh, a lot of people have lost their sense of taste and smell. So I don't know that I answered your question. Joe may have some suggestions about deterrence for rodents and other pests like that. Uh, and I would say be safe with all that you do. Somebody sent me a picture of a little chihuahua that got caught on a sticky trap, uh, uh, you know, and the dog was kind of wearing it like, like it was part <laughs> of him. But those things are hard. It's kind of hard to get off. Uh, your Dawn uh, and WD-40 sometimes, you need to wash all the things off. Those things are hard to remove, though, once you get on it. All right, Mikey, thanks for the call. And I would uh, remind you that some of the things we've talked about uh, on the show previous is to one of the deterrents for getting the, the, you know, the rodents and things is to just make sure that there are no spots that the obvious spots where they can get in the holes and and that sort of thing. So maybe just take a trip around the house and and uh, try to make sure that there are no easy access points uh, for rodents. Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the backup for that would be because it's, it's really hard to make sure every little cr- crack that they can get in has been closed up. The backup would be cats. <laughs> I, I have two in the house, and uh, believe me, they they hear every rustle of paper or yeah. or whatever. So that's you know, cats will do the trick. Now in the summertime, people don't like snakes around, but snakes can go where cats can't go, and you know, a gray rat snake will eat rats and mice. Oh, so that's something to think about if you're. But you may be squeamish about those as well as the rats and mice. 
But that's a good point, and uh, this, what Dr. Major said that as well. You know, I know my, my cat will stare at the smallest insect that possibly got into the house, you know, that's up on the roof or, or the ceiling, and it's a lot of times you see him and he's just intently staring at it, and I can't even see what he's staring at, he's, but you're right. They're good at... He's seen it move. He's yeah. Seen, uh, seen it move. Mine will do that for a moth. See, a little moth will fly in through the door, and uh, they go. There. But on the subject of birds and the sense of smell, the received wisdom for years was that birds can't smell very, not very well. But ornithologists are learning that they may have a better sense of smell than, than we previously thought. Some of the seabirds find their nest uh, in a rocky cliff by the odor of the, of the young. The nest itself has sort of a, a, gives off an odor. So birds may be able to smell better than we think they can, some species anyway. Very good. This is uh, Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We're visiting today with uh, biologist Joe McGee, one of our favorite guests to have on the program. So, Joe, uh, when we talk about bird houses or, or, or bird boxes, will any species of bird use man-made uh, things? No, but I sometimes I may ask about that. If, if a mockingbird will use, you know, our state bird, will that bird, will a mockingbird nest in a nest box? And the answer is no. Only a few species actually do that, or, or I don't know, maybe a couple of dozen in Mississippi. Uh, are well-known uh, users of bird boxes. They're the, the so-called cavity nesters, and the most, two of the most, two of our favorite birds are cavity nesters: the eastern bluebird and the purple martin. Uh, both of those will will use a, a nest box, or actually, in the case, well, yeah, uh, purple martins will use a, an elaborate nest box, a, a, a nest apartment. <laughs> really, some of the some of the housing available for purple martins uh, is multi-chambered. You can have, you know, uh, 24 purple martins nesting in a single wow. uh, apartment, uh, purple martin apartment. Um, so would the easiest way if someone wanted to try something would be to, say, Google bluebirds and, and then or vet nesting box or something. And then because I would imagine there's different types and birds prefer different types. Yeah. Uh, the dimensions. There's actually a standard nest box that's. Uh, uh, you can find the plans for that from the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, and uh, you just vary the the sizes of that. And the most important thing is to get the the entrance hole the right diameter. For instance, for eastern bluebird, you'd want it to be an inch and a half. If it's larger than that, that's okay. They can get in there. But other things that you might not want can as well, like starlings. You might not want starlings. Something really important about nest boxes is to think about where you're going to mount it. And it needs to be mounted so those feral cats and other otherwise free-roaming cats can't get to it. Believe you me, they will investigate a nest box once the little ones start ch- uh, chipping. So it's, it, if you can't control the cat situation, probably better not to put one, not to put a nest box up. Got a call on the line uh, from Evelyn in Jackson. Good morning, Evelyn. You're on the air with us. Good morning. This is Evelyn, and I've got my father John with me. All right. We uh, uh, we like. Last year, I got a finch with Niger seed, uh, a finch feeder up. And last Friday at my father's house, we saw some uh, gold finches. Of course, they're not gold this time of year. They're more olivey uh, yellow uh, in these bird baths. So we put up a bird feeder, but they haven't come back. Are so you- we're wondering what time of year in Mississippi, because in this part of Mississippi, I'm in Jackson. Um, they only come when in the in quote the winter. Right, that's right. This is the time of year to put it up and start expecting them. You've seen them. See, I haven't seen any at all at my house, but you have seen them at least once, right? At my parents' house uh, near Manhattan Park in Jackson. Now, my house, which is near Boyd Elementary, and that's about two miles away. Uh, I haven't seen them there yet. Yeah, but they're in the area. You, they just haven't found your feeders yet. Uh, the the niger seed are kind of expensive, but the goldfinches will come to black oil sunflower, which are less expensive. So you can keep those out until you. We re- do. Yeah, until we you really. We keep that out as yeah. well. When you really start seeing when they've, and right now there's lots of native stuff for them to eat. I don't have many birds coming to my feeders right now. But I have white-throated sparrows and chipping sparrows, cardinals, and that's really about it. Occasionally a blue jay. But well, my the, father is jealous because I have black uh, red-winged blackbirds flocks coming to mind yeah they can really clean it out uh, i have a few I, you, i'm glad you mentioned that i have a few red winged blackbirds coming too but you know the weather is so mild now there's lots for them to find in the uh, out in the environment in the woods and whatnot if we certainly have an ice storm you could probably expect finches to cover up your feeders 
Well, I don't think this winter we're going to have an ice storm with my <laughs> no, name. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think it's a good opportunity. I will say, I last year was my first year to put up Niger seed, and I did not know that the gold finches weren't gold when they are here. When they Now, in the springtime, they start turning gold, and about two weeks later, they're out of here going up north. But I think North Mississippi gets them year-round. That's right, yeah. Uh, at the Strawberry Plains Audubon Center, you can see gold finches year-round. Uh, I've seen them in drinking out of hummingbird, the, the ant guards on hummingbird feeders, uh, mm-hmm. in uh, early September. And they were, you know, the males were bright gold, black and gold. Yeah, not in Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, could but, ha- it could happen, but they, though. It's wonderful, though, to have, uh, if people are going to get a feeder, I suggest, re- I recommend get investing in the slightly more expensive, longer ones, because you'll get eight or ten at a time on it, and that's really uh, fun to watch. Yeah, that's right. And the, the feeders and the birdhouses that we were mentioning, are they're out in the elements. They need to be substantial. They need to be well-made and, and be able to take the... The, the rough weather, and the birds themselves are rough on the feeders. Yeah, my, my uh, Niger feeder, Niger seed feeder is metal, and they can hang upside down on that and everything. We we, uh, we enjoy doing the birding and everything. So, And my uh, bluebird box, occasionally we'll get a black cat chickadee family or, a, or yeah. a, something like that yeah, in it, that uh, or a sparrow. Me. Yeah, that happens to me. Uh, it's Carolina chickadees that we have in Mississippi. We don't have the black-capped chickadees. But uh, every now and then, I have chickadees nest in my bluebird nest box. And when that happens, I just put up another box <laughs> some distance away for the bluebirds. All right, Evelyn, thanks for your call this morning. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Time for one final break this hour. When we get back, we'll talk to uh, Joe McGee, continuing our bird discussion, but also talk a little bit about frogs. Dr. Major still on hand, ready for any pet questions, so if you have one, call us at one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Back to wrap things up after this. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Each week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. I'm Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. And our guest today is our friend Joe McGee, a biologist who talks to us about frogs and birds and other things. We've been talking about birds today. want to wrap up our discussion in just a bit about frogs. But uh, first, we do have a caller on the line, and it's Sarah in Vicksburg. Good morning, Sarah. Go ahead. Hey, good morning. Um, I worked with Joe... And also Libby at the Science Museum many, oh, yeah. many moons ago. Yeah, hello, Good Sarah. Good to hear y'all today. Um, we're talking about white-throated sparrows. Uh, I was watching a documentary on Disney Nature about bears. Actually, it's called Bears. Um, great little documentary. And we were hearing, my daughter's like, that, I, I, I recognize that song. And it was, in fact, white-throated sparrows singing. I guess they were in Alaska in the summertime. And so um, we had a discussion about now we have these white-throated sparrows singing in our yard here in December. And um, we're just thinking about, well, could, could these white-throated sparrows from Alaska actually be here in Mississippi? Um, so anyway, we had a good time talking about that, and I was just wondering if... Um, do we have any idea where our white-throated sparrows have migrated from to here this time of year? Point north. I'm not sure if you're seeing uh, white throats from uh, Alaska or not. So we need a ba- need some banding uh, experiments, right? Somebody band the birds yes. <laughs> on the breeding ground in uh, Alaska. But we do know we get them from upstate New York and Vermont, Maine, our north states that border Canada up in the northeast. That's where we, we do know we get them. And there's a song. And I'm, usually when they arrive in the fall, and say mid to late October, 
I get up one morning and it's like a frosty morning and they're singing. But this year they snuck in. I don't know when they arrived, to tell you the truth. But they are singing now in my yard. All right, Sarah, thanks for your call. <clears throat> uh, so, Joe, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, man-made birdhouses, uh, bird uh, nest box, those sorts of things. Uh, if you can or don't construct one, where else might a bird make a nest around your house? Yeah, they might nest in an old woodpecker hole. And that's one reason that if you can possibly leave a dead tree standing, to leave it standing because the woodpeckers will come along eventually and excavate uh, a cavity in that to nest in. And when they're through with it, there's a host of other birds, our, our cavity nester birds, that will, that will use that nest box. And other animals too, like flying squirrels and even tree frogs will sometimes use a, uh, 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 an old woodpecker hole. But if the, if the tree is too close to your house, obviously you would have to, or driveway, say, or something like that, you'd have to, to move it because uh, it could eventually fall down on your, on your house. But, yeah, that's how it all got started. The woodpeckers are the primary cavity nesters. They do the, the heavy lifting, if you will, <laughs> and then the, our other birds come along and use it when the woodpeckers are through. Now, there's one species of bird, very, uh, it's a favorite of everyone, it's the purple martin, and they are no longer n- known to use woodpecker cavity or any kind of natural cavity, like a knot hole in a tree. They're totally dependent now on man-made uh, birdhouses or, or nest, bo- nest boxes, apartment houses. Uh, in, uh, in the east, uh, on the west coast, out where, where Libya is right now, uh, the, the uh, purple martins are, do still use old woodpecker holes and natural, natural cavities. But in the east, they're totally dependent on humans. I've uh, got about two minutes left. What about uh, frogs? What are they doing this time of year? Boy, they're getting ready. Uh, I'm anxious for it, to, for it to start full swing. I have a little spring, spring peeper courses in one of the first ones we hear after Christmas. But some of them can't wait. Some of those males can't hold their horses, so to speak. And there's been a spring peeper calling in my yard uh, off and on since late October. And I, sh- I suspect we'll start hearing uh, spring peeper choruses and chorus frog choruses very soon, if uh, certainly but right after Christmas or right after New Year's. Those are the two that we look forward to hearing right after the holidays. Uh, we got about a minute left. Let's end the show. Susan is called in from Meridian. Susan, go ahead. You're on the air with us. I had, I feed my birds on an old six by 12 trampoline. So I get the squirrels too. But very quickly, this week I saw four black birds that were so black, and when they would move, they, they turned blue. What mm-hmm. were they? Mm-hmm. Those were probably grackles, common grackles. Were they kind of large, about the size of a yeah. blue jay? Yeah. yeah. About the size of a blue jay. Uh, those are very likely common grackles. They have a sh- their feathers or their plumage is iridescent, and that's what you were seeing. Yes, and it was gorgeous. And sometimes, if you're in a, an area where cattle are being fed, you'll see flocks numbering in the hundreds, if not thousands, or we're used to anyway. Common grackles, a neat bird. All right, uh, Susan. Thanks for your call. Uh, and Joe, as we wrap up, any uh, resources if someone's looking to build uh, a nest box? Well, one of the best resources is a birdhouse book by Donald and Lillian Stokes. Uh, Cornell Laboratory even, even uh, recommends this book. It has uh, everything anyone could ever want to know about building a, a nest box. All right. The plans and the species that use them and so forth. That's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio. Funding is provided in part by listeners. To hear today's show or a previous show, go to mpbonline.org slash creature comforts. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener today was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Joe McGee, I'm Kevin Farrell. Inviting you to stay tuned because up next, it's AutoCorrect. This is MPP Think Radio.